Last week we pointed out that in some matters the modern concepts of anthropology <coughs> come into conflict uh, with metaphysical teachings covering approximately the same area of human thought and interest. This conflict continues into our present session and in order to clarify it as much as we can we must try to cover the several related fields which influence the major theme. Today anthropology stands in a kind of middle distance between two other forms of learning. On one side is ethnology which is more or less ethnic biology. It has to do with the exact problems of man's biological ascent in nature and culminates in the rise of social conditions. On the opposite side of anthropology is psychology which is concerned profoundly with many of the elements which are now regarded as peculiarly uh, the property of the anthropological group. Thus between biology and psychology, anthropology takes a middle position deriving certain of its data from each of these opposing or contrasting groups. And tonight as our subject deals with the nature of soul and the problem of the ensouling of man, uh, we come to another interesting situation. We have heard many definitions of souls, theological and philosophical. We also recognize the scientific approach uh, to the psychic equation in human life. But now we must consider for a moment a phase of the subject which perhaps has not generally come to our attention, namely the soul in terms of anthropology. It is quite different in many distinct details from other concepts. Aristotle anciently opined that the soul was in some way directly associated with motion that in a sense things move because of the psychic life within them. Now this motion principle, however, Aristotle refined in many ways. But at the same time, although he distinguished various types of motion, he still held to the conviction that it is the soul that moves things. And that this motion is of itself of two kinds, movement in terms of body and movement which is not in terms of body. Movement in terms of body we, be, we behold around us constantly. Movement in terms which are not of body we also intellectually behold until it becomes almost as familiar to us as the movement of body. Yet this movement which is not of body re requires a different approach in an effort to understand its meaning and its part in our way of life. This non-body motion may be likened to a qualitative motion as distinguished from a quantitative or physically directive motion. A man walking uh, from Los Angeles to San Diego accomplishes the crossing of a quantitative interval which we describe in terms of miles. He does this by means of a motion, a motion arising within himself by which he is able to take this long and tiresome walk. 
another man moving from the state of ignorance to the state of knowledge also crosses an interval. An interval perhaps more difficult to cross than the miles between Los Angeles and San Diego. Yet by the methods used to measure the travel of the walking man, we are unable to approach or conceive the interval crossed by the thinking man. Thus we have a motion which does not move things visibly or physically, but does make possible the bridging of intervals and distances of a qualitative nature. Thus we must have a quantitative and a qualitative motion. In ancient times, qualitative motion was perhaps more interesting to man uh, than it is today. Seeking to understand the movement of the psyche in himself, the movement of his own soul life, man began to identify motion of the soul with anthropological or cultural motion. Thus in one definition, anthropology is the science of the cultural motion in man or the soul motion in man. It does not deal primarily with clinical problems. It deals with the grand motion of culture. If a man writes a book, and I read one not long ago, and he was a learned man, and he wrote a book entitled The Soul of Greece. Now this book had absolutely nothing to do with religion, metaphysics, or psychology as we commonly think of these terms. It had to do essentially with anthropological motion. In searching for the soul of Greece, this particular author gave us an outline of its philosophies, its religions, its arts, its sciences, its beliefs and opinions on a variety of subjects. And though he covered the fields of religion and philosophy, he did not do this as a metaphysician or as a mystic. He merely recognized religion and philosophy as aspects of culture, as the results or part of the results arising from the ascending human contact with the refinements of mature living, the association of the person and the group with an overall psychic conviction, pattern, or way. The anthropological aspect of this then tells us that cultures are not usually totally indigenous. Culture represents a stream moving anthropologically through humanity or moving humanity along a road or path. All culture groups derive certain knowledge or conviction from preceding groups and bestow a certain fruitfulness upon all succeeding groups. Thus culture may rest for a time with a people, but culture moves from nation to nation, from race to race, from generation to generation, enriched in its motion by the contributions of countless peoples, many of whom no longer exist as independent cultural groups. This motion then of a cultural stream through time, a stream invisible as far as our physical senses are concerned, but constantly impelling to the performance of actions which are visible or consequences which can be seen. This motion is the anthropological psyche. It is the movement of man's attainment. It is the continual enrichment of this movement. It is the eternal and endless progression of things 
in terms of the unfolding of their attributes and the enrichment of the institutions which they create as they move down through history. The soul then to these peoples, to this anthropological group, is the consummation or the summary of culture at any given time and under any given group of circumstances. It can be examined historically. It can be contemplated philosophically. It can be approached religiously. But these represent interpretations of something which has a nature in itself. This thing that has a nature in itself, an accumulating, unfolding, growing entity of its own, is the cultural soul of man. Thinking in these terms and upon this foundation then, we come upon immediately certain other factors which have to be taken into consideration. We can either follow the materialistic point of view, merely that culture is therefore the continuous heaping up or aggregation of common attainment, that each generation through its own natural experience with phenomena enriches the total cultural life of the world and that the outstanding individual who attains in any particular so that he leaves an impress upon his time or upon his people or upon future ages becomes a powerful cultural unit and up to the present time a small group of perhaps 15 or 20,000 persons recorded out of the total body of history represent the spearhead of man's cultural progress. Culture is therefore not only vested in the accumulation of total groups, it is led or moved dynamically by individuals who respond in an exaggerated or larger way to the reactions which to the ordinary person uh, are met uh, with less intensity or less directive. If in this thinking uh, we come to a point of de deviation between uh, anthropology and metaphysics, perhaps this di division again is not as real as at first appears. For a long time we have been plagued with an attitude, namely that if a certain effect is visible to us, a certain condition arises in our phenomenal world, we assume that the cause of that condition must always be according to the dominant way of thinking which most influences our times. It does not occur to us that comparatively similar effects can arise from widely different causes. This point we have to give some special attention to. Uh, we know that we are not always correct when we use the sensory perceptions as a means of establishing fact. We know that for a great period of time human beings actually believe that the sun set in the west because it appeared to do so. They assumed that the diurnal motion was the motion of the sun. They did not realize that it was actually the rotation of the earth itself. Thus explanations were built which satisfied things which men could see, but these explanations were not true. It follows by this that an explanation which is plausible and even probable and may be strongly supported and, suspend and sustained by physical evidence may at the same time not be true. From this we must proceed then to the fact that we observe culture. We know that man is moving. We know that he is unfolding an individual and collective psychic entity. We are not, however, at this time, 
in a good position to analyze the actual cause of this cultural motion. We are not sure that it is merely the result of constant impact of external stimuli, nor are we sure that the possibility of culture is sustained by hereditary descent or by certain fortunate uh, biological factors in the life of an individual or a collective group. Thus the physical circumstances upon which both psychology and anthropology function may exist with explanations other than those now broadly and generally accepted. We have reason to understand this perhaps merely by a program of research into past thought. And we will find in so doing that persons of admirable abilities and extraordinary intellect came to conclusions long ago which we no longer accept as valid. We have advanced others, but there is no reason to doubt that in time to come others following us will find still more adequate explanations which may or may not sustain those that we now regard as sufficient. Therefore, in the study of our psychic problem, we have no absolute certainty that the human soul is identical with culture. We have no actual certainty that the human soul is identical with mind. We find such identities convenient they seem to answer questions not easily answered without such concepts. But every concept, though it may increase the reasonableness of our conclusions, every concept fails in some particular. We have never yet developed a concept which is totally and completely sufficient. Today, perhaps, our concepts include more than was once known. But on the other hand, to strengthen and, our develop, and develop our concepts, we have been forced to reject a great deal of evidence that was once held to be valid. In order to make our own way of life scientifically acceptable, for example, we have had to deny almost categorically the miraculous, the mystical, and numerous occasions and instances strongly sustained by history and not easily assailable. We have had to ignore them and deny them simply because they will not fit into our prevailing attitudes. So every time we have a new attitude we gain something and we lose something. And in the course of time, the trend in modern thinking has been for man to gain greater objectivity, but to lose more and more of his subjectivity. To lose in the progress of growth a great many concepts and ideas which were essentially beautiful, noble, and calculated to improve him culturally. Thus in our way of life today, we have advanced certain specializations, but most persons of thoughtful mind will agree that our cultural situation is not secure, that we have sacrificed too much of the nobility of man in the quest of exactitudes, and in the sacrificing of this nobility we have weakened man as a being and we have thrown culture into opposition with science. Advancing science at the expense of culture, advancing certain phases of ourselves at the cost of the total self. <coughs> it is quite possible therefore that the anthropological soul the cultural soul of man is itself 
sustainable as a concept, but not as a total one, that it is an aspect of something greater than itself. And it is also quite probable that nearly every concept that we have is depending upon concepts which we do not have, and that for a total and sufficient way of life, we must have more knowledge of causes than we presently possess, and must therefore be able to generate larger concepts, more holistic, more total, than those which we have and know today. If, in the study of the descent of man, we want to pause for a moment then and bring up to date that which was the ancient and previous thinking of man, in order that we may view this thinking in terms of our present situation. And we will begin with a little bit with the philosophical background of the doctrine or idea which is now embodied in anthropology. Ancient man, rationalizing, contemplating upon the mystery of himself and of the world in which he found himself, early came to the conclusion that all outward things are moved by inward forces. Also that all inferior bodies in nature are moved by superior forces or by powers greater than themselves. We have this in the Socratic and Platonic concepts of motion where we have orders of things, the unmoved, the self-moving, and the moved. We know that some things are moved. We know that the breaking up of a winter in the north brings down great masses of ice and carries with the flooding torrents, trees and even houses, great rocks and boulders. We know therefore that while these things do not move of themselves, they are moved. Therefore that motion can be imparted to things from without, as is the case of a person tossing a ball. The motion of the ball is not inherent in the ball. It is inherent in the person tossing the ball. On the other hand, there are things in which motion is inherent. Things which are of themselves self-moving. And of those things which are self-moving, the world of the animal kingdom around us, including ourselves, may be regarded as the outstanding example. Man is a self-moving creature. Truly, he can be moved by circumstance. He can be physically moved by conditions around him. He may ride on a train, which carries him not by, its, by his own motion, but by a mechanical motion. But he may also be moved to action of his own, and mostly to decision, to attitude, and the motion of the individual from within himself, philosophically speaking, is the source of culture. It is the motion of the person, a movement from within, imparted to other things. Therefore, culture is not the painting, but the power to paint. It is not the building, but the power to build. All things in themselves which are physically achieved by culture, bear witness to it, but they are not culture. They are monuments to culture. But culture itself is a living motion in man, present because man is self-moving, that he is capable of both quantitative and qualitative motion within his own nature. In this he is unique among the species which we know in that he has carried qualitative motion further than any other form of life that is visible to us. Being a self-moving creature, man must therefore be moved by that which conveys motion or contributes motion. And the Greeks, the Orientals, many, many ancient peoples assumed, therefore, 
that man's qualitative motion is due to his own soul, to a life motion in himself, to the existence within his nature of a psychic entity. That this psychic entity is the cause of all things about man uh, which cause him to move gradually from a biological to an anthropological foundation, finally perhaps to a psychological footing. This psychic life within man manifests early in the human experience and produces a variety of interesting, if somewhat conf confusing, results. Philosophically, man is recognized as a thinking animal. He is also recognized as a creature possessing within himself the power to imagine, the power to visualize. In the process of imagination, therefore, we find man polarized between two qualities of his own psychic nature. One is imagination and the other is memory. By memory, man is bound to the past. By imagination, man can anticipate the future. Imagination is therefore an overtone, a motion toward the unknown. Now imagination can lead to fantasy. It can also lead to hallucination. It can result in the individual surrounding himself with unreal and unreasonable fears. It can terrify the individual and tyrannize upon all of his other faculties. But in its natural and proper state, particularly under a cultural background, imagination becomes man's escape forward. It makes possible the dream of future. The dream of future makes orderly progress natural and reasonable for man. Now pause for a moment again and turn to the religious consideration. As we go back anthropologically into the history of man, we perceive that the religious equation arises very early in his human experience. One of the earliest observations of man has had to do with the difference between that which could be explained and that which could not be explained. Uh, not in this case empiric necessarily, but in terms of his own experience. That which any man cannot explain occupies a different relationship to him than that which he can explain. That which can be explained is normal. That which cannot be explained is hypernormal, or supernormal, or supernatural. Consequently, man's relationship with life has always been divided into two parts, his relationship with the known and his relationship with the unknown. Now there are tribes in various parts of the world who have tried to solve the problem of such relationships. One of them was the Yazids of Iraq, a group of people whom we call the Yazidi. They still exist as a small religious sect, sometimes called devil worshippers. These devil worshippers are very intriguing because of the basic logic which dominates their thinking. These people are not really devil worshippers. They believe in a good God, but they do not feel or or sense the need to worship this good God. Why offer or pray or in one way or another attempt to please a good God? If this God is good, he is not going to hurt you anyway. On the other hand, there are the unknown negative forces of nature, personified in the concept of evil. These people, therefore, find it in their thinking more utilitarian to try to keep evil spirits happy than to worry about good spirits. It is of no concern to them 
whether they worship God or not, because God understands everything, knows everything, and is eternally good. But the evil spirits, likely to bring plagues and pestilence, and to destroy the harvest, and to make women barren, and to cripple children, or to strike down the mature in their fullness of age, these kind of beings we must always cater to. So it is to the evil spirits that the foods and offerings are made and that the prayers are raised, asking these spirits not to hurt them. There is no use asking God not to hurt them because he will not. Now this is a simple example of what more or less divided man at a very early period. This problem of the known with which he could cope and the unknown with which he could not cope. And around the unknown which was mystery, he developed a series of positive attitudes, positive concepts about the negative. These positive concepts about negation <coughs> resulted in the primitive social religious structure of savage peoples. It consisted of man's attempting to anticipate with his own consciousness the invisible factors of life around him. He was unable to do this rationally. <coughs> he had to do it emotionally. He was unable to prove one step of his journey, yet he believed definitely in the journey because of other things which he could prove and which became obvious to him. When one child grew up and the other child died, there could only be one answer, namely a supernatural factor. As far as he could tell, there was no natural solution. Therefore, he began to think in terms of the evil eye, of witchcraft, and of innumerable machinations, by means of which the life of the child could be destroyed by sorcery or something of that nature. There was no other explanation. In many cases, of course, we know that th this sorcery was merely an ancient name for lack of hygiene. But ancient man did not know that. So while he knew nothing of hygiene or eugenics, these subjects were magic. He was unable to systematize any way of coping with the implications uh, in fields where he had no knowledge. Therefore, he created an elaborate network of intangibles by means of which he satisfied to a measure his own concepts. Now, why was he in need of satisfying his concepts? Because, as anthropology points out, from the beginning, man had certain cultural instincts. These cultural instincts uh, were very strong in ancient times. And one of these cultural instincts was that things could not happen without reason. There has to be an explanation. And as the God concept developed, this explanation could not and must not conflict with the belief in a good God. Therefore, God could not be finally held responsible for ungodly situations. And it was needed that other things should be introduced to form bridges or links or to provide explanations for things otherwise not to be explained. Out of all of this together, there rose a primitive religious psychic life. And from this came another very important psychological factor, namely that man began to be moved by imponderables. He was no longer simply moved by the weather. He was no longer moved totally by the migration of animals, which he had to follow in order to secure food. He was no longer moved by storms or by any of these things primarily. He began to find other causes for major trends or major motions in his own affairs 
And these causes were his beliefs, his attitudes, his convictions, and the rising structure of consequential conclusions. Thus man began to be inwardly moved by psychic pressure. Now we may wonder, and we do have to ask, whether this psychic pressure was totally the result of man living in a material mystery for which he had to find supernatural solutions, or whether these supernatural solutions to which he turned were available to him and he was impelled toward them only because of a psychic necessity within his own nature. In other words, is man to be de decided as having been moved only by heredity and experience, or was he also moved by the fact that there was in him something by which he was human, and that this humanity gave him a different perspective, made possible the engendering of the element of mystery in his own consciousness, and that man gradually evolved mystery because he had a unique capacity for mystery, a capacity not so obvious in the other kingdoms of nature. Your religionist will assume that this was true, and that at a certain time in the remote development of man, something was contributed to him by which he was unique, and that this uniqueness rested in his humanity, for it is in his humanity alone that he is unique. We remember the story of the two Greeks that met out in front of the amphitheater and one said he was going to the games and would be happy to take his friend. His friend, who was a philosopher of parts, declined. And the man who was going to the games said, you are missing a wonderful opportunity. For this afternoon you will see men that can run faster than deers. You will see athletes who are stronger than bears. You will see swimmers that can swim better than fish. The philosopher nodded, yes, that's all probably true, but I'm not interested. But I will go with you when you can show to me a man, not who excels other animals, but who thinks, acts, feels, lives like a god, like his own uniqueness, not deriving his superiority from excelling in animal propensities but by the excellence of his own humanity. This thought would also correspond uh, with one strong opinion on the problem of man's soul nature. Anthropologists, ethnologists, zoologists, and many other branches of scientific thinkers have a number of little problems that they are not too able to explain. The animal kingdom, for example, is not merely one kingdom. Certainly, we can divide it uh, without destroying the overtone of the collective animal type. But we know that there is some reason why a deer is not a dog. There is also a reason why a cat will always be a cat and that this creature will have certain qualities and attributes which cannot be reconciled with or made similar to the attributes of a squirrel. Thus there are differences, differences which cannot be totally explained by environment, differences which seem to indicate that within the animal structure itself there are differentiations, that these differentiations will emerge and will reveal infinite specialization. Nature supporting this in many instances does not permit in its natural procedure the interbreeding of unrelated types, and usually where such 
interbreeding may accidentally occur, the progeny is sterile. Nature does not wish these types to be at least immediately reconciled. We must then come to the conclusion that there are differences in the archetypes or basic patterns of specialized forms of life. That these differences, while they exist markedly in animals, are not due to the psychological pressures which might cause differences in human beings. They are not due to religion, philosophy, and other cultural environments. They are due to something innate in the creature itself. These differences can be understood, but they cannot be totally overcome. Man differs from the other members of the animal kingdom in one other particular, namely that whereas these other animals are divided into groups or into types or kinds, Man, very largely, is an individual species in himself. Each human being is different in many respects from other human beings. He does not have the general instincts which mark a species or type of animals. If we have seen a cow, studied a cow, analyzed a cow, and perhaps uh, psychoanalyze that cow as far as we can we have then a fair concept of cow and we may meet 10,000 cows without any marked variation but you can never analyze any human being so adequately that you know how any other human being thinks you have a much greater individualization here so that the human being becomes a distinct order of life in himself. <coughs> Truly, this distinction develops uh, gradually. Yet, as our anthropologist knows, you can go to a small island somewhere in what we would, might term an underprivileged area, and we will find 20 tribes on that island in comparatively close proximity to each other. And as far as we can discover, they have lived together there for an indefinite period of time, perhaps a thousand years, perhaps two thousand years, perhaps for an unknown period of time. Yet that little group of tribes, have never that little group has never become one entity. Fifteen tribes, maybe with not more than 500 members in each tribe and not more than 10 miles apart. 15 tribes, 15 languages. Perhaps in route, similar, but not actually able to understand each other. 15 religions. Entirely different groups of attitudes. There are cases where in a group like that, one group will be cannibal, but not the others. There is another type of situation that is also noticeable there. One group may be agricultural, and another will still depend upon fishing and hunting for survival. One of these little groups may have created a comparatively well-organized cultural government. The next group, 20 miles away, is in anarchy and always has been. Out in the hinterland where you come upon these things, you can become continuously aware that neither proximity nor similarity of environment will result in identity in human type. There can only be one answer, that the division is deeper. The anthropologist insists that cultural division is enough. This is doubtful and a number of progressive thinkers in the field are beginning to recognize that we've got to go deeper. In going deeper, therefore, we are searching now, anthropologically speaking, for the psychological factors in differentiation. And they are certainly present, and we cannot ignore them. Now, if we go into our mystical religions, 
into our so-called esoteric systems. Only a term which should not be considered so frightening as many uh, so-called educated people have come to believe, for it simply means, in this sense, uh, beliefs or traditions that have long been held either in secret or have become so broadly neglected that they have continued only in the custodianship of a few persons. Many so-called esoteric ideas were once common knowledge, even as many of our modern ideas were once esoteric. We cannot fail to observe that that motion goes both ways. Among the peoples of ancient times, who anthropologically are important to us, because we observe in them primary pressures, and the student of primitive psychology is deeply concerned with these elements also. In these primitive peoples, we have from the beginning the strong concept that man is primarily a psychic entity that man differs from other known creatures because he is ensouled, because a living, thinking, feeling being is in the core and central part of his own nature. He therefore divides himself from the animal not because of the difference of body, but because he firmly believes that he is not his body, but that he is truly a person living in a body. Up to very recently, science has taken the attitude that there is no separate person occupying the human body, that the personality arises within the body and its experiences and its reflexes. But ancient man was convinced that he had a psychic entity. And even among such peoples as those we mentioned, the 15 little tribes on the island, the belief in this psychic entity is perhaps one of the few things that they shared in common. They had different interpretations of it. But all these little groups had some concept even as aboriginal savages, they had some concept of a being in their own bodies. That they were not merely animated forms, but that this being in the body was more important than the body. Most ancient peoples also held that in some way this being is in an association with the body, but is not subject totally uh, to the changes and modifications which occur in the body. One medieval thinker expressed it in a very interesting way. If soul is a byproduct of body, why is not the psychic life of man changed if he loses both legs? He is then no longer the same organization that he was before. Something is gone. Yet the loss of his arms, the loss of his legs, even the infirmities of his sensory perceptions do not essentially change his being. And usually, except in cases of certain types of disease which destroy function or structure, the actual entity of the individual does not greatly alter until the time of the general dissolution of the body. Also, most persons have recognized or realized that while the body passes through a series of conditions, that these conditions associated with the infirmities of age, or what we would term chronological aging, that these conditions are not contributed to the psychic being or entity. Once the individual recovers from the peculiar negative psychology of childhood and attains 
a more or less complete administration of his own nature from that time on, say from his teens to the end of his life. The being is not aware of aging. It becomes conscious of aging only through the infirmities of its body, but it is never itself able to determine as an inward, noumenal experience, whether it is twenty or forty. It must look in the mirror. It must depend upon some external factor. And about the only difference that we note is body difference, resulting in loss of function, loss of vitality, or the exhaustion of bodily resources. The individual has these infirmities, but the knower in the body is essentially timeless. Primitive man found this out. It forced him, therefore, to the inevitable conclusion that when he was seventy, he did not feel inside any different from the way he felt at twenty. And if there was an essential difference in his condition, this difference was due to psychological factors. His friends told him he was old. People began getting chairs for him. <laughs> Folks ran forward and helped him upstairs. These are the ways he discovered that he was old. Gradually he came to believe it. Also, as among the Chinese, uh, who differ from us in so many details, age having a peculiar advantage. We have young Chinese people sitting around waiting, hopefully, to grow old. They want to grow old, because until they get to be 60 or 70, they are not really leaders in their way of life. China used to, and probably to some measure still does, reward years with the benefits that we reserve for youth. That is influence, power, security, happiness, uh, opportunity of all kinds. When Sun Yat-sen became president of China, he convened a congress and told the various districts to send their senators and representatives. It was a simple matter. Every district selected the oldest living inhabitant. The result is half the representatives died before they got to the congress. <laughs> but it was the way things were done. In many cases, some cases, the records tell us that these representatives were brought in carriages and in carts because they could no longer walk. But they were the leaders. They were the great people. So a difference in psychology arises here. The primitive man from the beginning sensed that there was a difference between his being and his body. From this came his inevitable conclusion that his relationship with the body was impermanent, was transitory. Another factor psychologically considered that came in here at an early date was that no human being, then or now, can experience the extinction of himself. No human being can actually experience the existence or state of not being. He may know that a hundred years ago he wasn't here, but he cannot experience anything about his own state of not being here. He may affirm that a hundred years from now most certainly he will not be here, but he cannot imagine the state of not being here. He can write his will, he can make all arrangements for his family and relatives, and he can be perfectly factual about the transition that is inevitable, but he cannot experience it. Therefore, no living person has ever experienced death, and no living person has ever experienced a state of non-existence. Primitive man, forthright in these matters, being absolutely unable to experience the non-existence of himself, although he watched his friends come and go, and even today in civilization as we know it, we are not so much wiser, because some of the most brilliant attorneys in the world die without making a will, 
nobody expects or provides except perhaps through cautiousness and responsibility but never through the sense of the fact that he is going to cease to exist because he cannot experience it he can only rationalize it it's a very different thing so ancient man came to the conclusion that he was not only alive but that he was life that he existed because he participated in something that had an e eternal existence that life was eternal that body appeared and disappeared he saw it happening in a sort of offhand way as he watched the annual death of trees and plants until they seemed to die and then in the spring of the next year they would come back to life again he saw therefore the continuous victory of an invisible thing called life over visible things which apparently could live and die out of this realization man came to the conclusion that life was superior to the body that it inhabited it that it inhabited this was logical reasonable philosophy sustained it on through time even till now inasmuch as that which moves other things must be superior to that which it moves superior in the sense that it possesses greater life thus as man through living proves that he is a servant of this invisible thing within himself and gradually his body becomes merely the instrument of his purpose which is not his body he resolves that his purpose is greater than his body that his purpose is more real than his body that it is more alive and because his purpose can move his body causing him to select a variety of activities often even detrimental to the body or that in heroism or in martyrdom he may voluntarily sacrifice his body for something he cannot see and that is a principle or a conviction within his own nature from this and countless other evidences which he came to understand man concluded that this thing in him this being was the better part of himself that in some way it formed an alliance with body this alliance through the mystery of birth was difficult for early man but a separation from body at death was not so difficult for him to comprehend he saw the body become inert he saw disintegration set to work within it he even recognized disintegration itself as a form of life but he saw that this friend this brother this parent this child who had come to the mystery of death that the body though it remained for a time had lost something something had left this body and the thing that had left it was the living being with nature with temperament with disposition with attitudes leaving behind only a comparatively commonplace body which had no particular attributes nor was it particularly interesting in itself in any way the thing that was interesting was gone the challenge was gone the dynamic was gone all that remained was clay and the processes of disintegration were gradually destroying this body they did not destroy it while the person lived therefore in order that it might be destroyed that person must leave or go something must change on the inside or this body could not disintegrate from so all these observations and from vast centuries of meditation upon them man devised gradually the concept of immortality he also devised the concept of the victory of life over death he recognized the possibility 
of an existence apart from body. He recognized this existence as possible by the simple phenomenon of death itself. For he realized that at death everything that was important went. The dead man did not leave his mind behind him. He did not leave his emotions behind him. As a person, as a being, he totally departed. The only thing that he left was a body. It therefore occurred to the Egyptian and the Hindu and other ancient peoples also that that which departed was a self-sufficient being differing from the ordinary being only in one particular, namely the absence of a tangible body. This led primitive man to surround the living with beings unembodied in the air around him. He believed that these beings had departed no great distance, that they were alive, that they were there, that they could accept his sacrifice and answer his prayer. The only difficulty was he could not see them. But even in this there was an exception. In sleep he could see them. They could return to him as dreams. He could internally restore their appearances. And he had a kind of inner life which seemed to bring him into contact with the kind of world where beings without bodies could live. And most of our early concepts of the afterworld were derived from dreams, from man feeling or believing that in sleep he passed through a kind of temporary death. St. Paul said, I die daily. And that in this sleeping procedure, the being also left the body or separated from it in some way. Therefore, because man could sleep, be unconscious, not know and not remember, yet he could awaken without any volition of his own, that sleeping and waking and all the decisions of life rested in the being not in the body. The being could come and go as it pleased. It was the protector, guardian, master of the body. Thus all our magical cults bring in these points, as Fraser points out in his Golden Bough. In this, man then began to contemplate the broader reaches of things and by the time of the rise of the great classical civilizations, the great philosophical systems of India, China, Egypt, Greece, Babylonia, Assyria, in these days men had also some knowledge of anthropology. They had some knowledge of the origin of species. They had a reasonably accurate insight into the historical descent of man from a savage to a cultured state. They also had a religious conviction, such as we find in the book of Genesis, where we discover that at a certain time in the development of primitive man, a fraternity was established between being and body. That being came to body, and that what we call humanity was actually a race of invisible beings that became embodied. Uh, that man had a psychic life that was eternal, everlasting, neither having beginning nor end. And that in this process of its eternal continuance, it formed periodic associations with body as in the East Indian doctrine of rebirth. Rebirth being nothing more or less than the periodic re-embodiment of a being, a being having the power of continuing between lives, even as consciousness has the power to continue in sleep or to pass through unconsciousness without dissolution. 
In the study then of the anthropological concepts, uh, the Christian philosophers, borrowing considerably from the old Jewish teachers, decided that man was a unique creation inasmuch as he was an ensouled animal. He was a being different because a superior order of life had entered into him, possessed him, and had made his body their temporary abode, or the abode of this order of life. To accomplish or to interpret this, they had to explain what would bring the soul or the being toward body. And out of this have come several different theories. The most familiar to us, of course, is the theory of the fall of man. In other words, man is embodied as the result of sin. That in some mysterious way, a divine order of beings rebelled against God. And for this, the order was hurled into the abyss, as Milton tells us in Paradise, in, uh, Paradise uh, Law, not uh, Dante, in uh, Paradise Lost. I'll get it in a moment. Milton's Paradise Lost. In this situation, we find an order of beings hurled headlong from the heavenly sphere as a result of the rebellion of the angels. In this case, the fall was due to disobedience, was therefore incidental or accidental. This, however, is not the common opinion of all peoples. Others believed that what we call the fall was a perfectly natural process in nature, representing no punishment but the inevitable need of the being to experience all things. In other words, we can say the deity or absolute spiritual life scattered itself as seed throughout space. And from these seeds grew up orders of life, which are God, or are one divine nature, unfolding throughout time and eternity to final restoration of their own total divinity. That therefore evolution, or a natural function of laws, is responsible for what we term the fall of man. Uh, this was the essential concept of the 19th century philosopher Herbert Spencer. Here we have two processes, involution and evolution. Involution being the motion of being into body. Evolution, the gradual motion of the release of being through body, and in a sense, from body. This concept then held as its principal situation or purpose that man, in what we term the evolutionary arc of his existence, has as his primary purpose as a being the full expression of this being in conduct, that this being is gradually molding, refining the body until this body becomes suitable to give full and complete expression to the being. That uh, growth, as we know it, is the revelation of being through body. That what we call evolution is ideation, or the unfolding of a conscious entity through the instruments or vehicles, by means of which it is able to function in a material state. Thus, for man, evolution is the unfoldment of being into ability for total function in the state of matter and total victory over the mystery of matter or the dark side of the unknown as this relates to matter. Most of the philosophic peoples have taken it for granted that man's embodiment was due to a divine plan or a divine order, or a divine will. But that having attained this embodiment, 
man then inherits a peculiar and natural human duty. If he is in body because of a divine plan, it is part of this plan to so place man here as to challenge him to work out his own salvation with diligence. Therefore, the primary purpose of man in this world is that he shall unfold himself through his body and shall attain dominion over the negative aspects of his own personality, these negative aspects being responsible for the ignorance and materialism with which the ages have been darkened. Thus our real reason here is that we may rescue ourselves from the state of unknowledge or partial knowledge which is the source of the confusion, misery, and misfortune uh, by which we seemingly are incessantly dogged in nature. If this followed their ancient idea, then the question is how and when did these things happen? Anthropology on a material level definitely postulates something. It does not know exactly what it postulates. It does not even assume perhaps that the complete statement of its postulation is possible. But it does distinctly note that at some time, under certain or some condition, man divided from the animal. That this division was more than the mere process of standing on its hind legs we may be reasonably certain that this elevation of posture was bound to something in nature more important than the fact that man preferred the food that grew high. <laughs> Apparently the giraffe did the same, <laughs> but did not become human as a result. Nor are we to assume that man inevitably proceeded from the anthropoid or from uh, the so-called great apes. These apes, it is true, have certain attributes and characteristics which are reminiscent of a primitive type of humanity. But the ape, although it has the body approaching that of human type, is still essentially an animal. It is a little wiser and a little more cunning than some animals, but it is not a dreamer. It has never created a work of art. It has never built a city. It has never dreamed a great religion into existence. This creature is still tied or bound to a kind of creation or if we do not wish to take this ground, and there are some who would like to differ, they will say that the primary difference between the beast and man is the vocal equipment, which has made possible the transmission of knowledge. This, however, is not entirely true, for we have in the animal kingdom intuitive faculties for transmission that are much more acute than human faculties. And we find that the animal, like all other creatures in nature, is able to transmit that which it is necessary for it to transmit. And that in this man has achieved no more, although he is on a different cultural platform. But actually, somewhere, anthropologically speaking, we have what Gabriel Max attempted to portray as the missing link. We had something that occurred. This something transformed man, placing within him a fire. And the Greeks symbolized this by Prometheus bringing the flame from heaven in a hollow stalk. This bringing of the flame, which centering itself in man, created in him a separateness that was to not only continue but to increase until an entirely new order of life was differentiated. This problem, when it happened, how it happened, what happened, these questions have never been satisfactorily answered by material science. Uh, the 
answer to them perhaps merely lies around some corner and they hope that someday they will find it. But in the meantime they have not found it. And we can suspect that some of our more intuitive ancestors had a better explanation than we have now. Not necessarily better than we may have sometime, but certainly better than we have today. One reason being that we have given up. The modern man is not really asking these basic questions anymore. He is intriguing his mind with secondary questions and frustrated in his effort to solve primary matters has turned from them because to continually think of them is only to remind himself of his own inabilities. Actually, uh, the ancients did contemplate this problem and attempted to understand it. And old mythologies and ancient legends and lore, all rich in this particular phase of speculation, in this type of thinking. The early Jewish scholars who were associated with the development of the Bible were of the distinct impression uh, that there were two creations described in Genesis. The first being the creation of man and the second being the creation of Adam. And you will find that they are in different chapters of Genesis even now. Now it is interesting that at the end of the first chapter of Genesis, man has been created. But the Lord is not satisfied. Because, as one of the verses tells us, there was no man to till the ground. So even after the man was created, there was nobody to till the ground. The man who was to till the ground did not come until the coming of Adam. And the two creations are distinctive. Some scholars are of the opinion that this was the result of the early blending of two totally different concepts of origin. One the Elohistic and the other the Yahvistic. That the ancient Jewish philosophy came from two roots. And that these two roots were never completely brought together. And that the two uh, creations of man in the opening chapters of Genesis relate to this phase of the old philosophy. Actually, however, there seems to be more to it than this. We are not told in the first creation uh, that the Lord breathed the breath of life into that man. The first man was not made a gardener or a keeper of the garden of the Lord nor was he given the power to name all things according to their natures. This came later. It was this man, the second man, who fell, and who was forced from the garden, and who also was given the coat of skins, the body, in which he must suffer and labor, and perpetuate his kind with the sweat of his brow. The first man was the Greek Anthropos, the idea man, the archetype, the man in heaven. And to these ancient peoples, the being in the body. The Adam Kadman, the man made of the red earth, flesh, was the second man, the body. And it was into this body that the breath of life, the psyche, the soul, the ghost, meaning breath, was given or was transmitted. And it was this man who also in due time became male and female and went forth, the man to earn his bread with the sweat of his brow and the woman to bring forth her children in pain. These were the body. These were the, the final result of the union of being and body. The unembodied being lived in heaven. And it was believed by the ancient Jewish scholars that the first man attended the school of the angels in heaven. The second man lived first in ether. 
in atmosphere. The body being a condensation gradually of invisible gases and substances. Finally he fell into a mortal or material state, becoming a physical body, precipitated out of invisible substances in the same way that a solar system is a visible structure precipitated, precipitated out of space and sustained by space, space itself being totally invisible and yet the inevitable source of every visible thing that exists in creation. Thus the motion of things from an invisible condition into a visible one may be regarded as a kind of fall. But this being that fell, fell into body, fell into a kind of sleep. And the Greeks have the same concept of souls falling into generation. Plato tells the same story. The Hindus have it, the Chinese have it, the Buddhists have it. All these accounts, then, lead to the inevitable concept that at an X point, which we may not be able to date in terms of chronology, but we can date it in terms of anthropological phenomena. At an X point, the primitive creature, which was to be and had been fashioned to be man, was quickened or made alive and became a living soul. This immediately set the destiny, but there was no visible, phenomenal moment in which this could be identified, for it required a very long time for the gradual drift of the ensouled animal from that animal which had not received the being into itself. Berossus in his Chaldean history describes this problem also. Speaking of the laboratory of nature in which innumerable forms were generated, forms with many heads and arms, forms with many bodies, giants and pygmies, the most incredible diversity. We ridicule it today, but there is nothing that he describes more incredible than a dinosaur or one of the pterodactyls or a brontosaurus, all these creatures we would not believe ever existed did we not find their fossil remains. No one could have convinced us otherwise. But Barossus tells us that in the dawn of things there was this riot of forms and then that these forms gradually became orderly and that among them the gods brought forth bodies suitable to become the, inhabit the habitations of beings. One way of saying that gods brought forth or created or fashioned would be simply to substitute the term evolution. Nature at some time produced an organism that could be ensouled. And in so doing, automatically drew life to it. For a body can never excel the life within it. And as body grows, the life within it always appears to exceed the body in which it is functioning. This brings us to an interesting philosophical truism advanced by Pythagoras of Samos. And he does it by means of his numerical philosophy. Pythagoras points out that you can take physical substances and that these physical substances become in a sense uh, ensouled always by totalities. Uh, one way to express that is to take six matches and place them along in a row. The moment you do this you ask someone what is there and they will say six matches. Now the term six is itself not composed of six parts. It is a single term to cover the phenomenon of six parts. Yet the concept of six is a unity apart from the elements which produce it. Therefore, six of any single objects brought into relationship with each other 
immediately create a unit or a unity which we call six. The soul of six is born when six items, units or elements, are placed in relationship so that they may form that design or bring forth the symbolism of that number. Now if you remove one of these matches, the unit six disappears and another unit takes its place, five. Now five is not just merely the sum of five separate pieces. Five is a total being or an entity in itself, an entity termed five. Five is a word which is the name of a sum, and that sum is a total. Yet by adding to and subtracting from the matches, all different kinds of sums are brought into manifestation, then the combination is changed and those sums are removed from manifestation. And a different one, a different sum, takes their places. Assuming man, for example, as Pythagoras says, to be equivalent to the number six. When nature brought together a series of parts constituting a sum called six, the result was the construction or the manifestation of an instrument by means of which the total concept of soul as six could come into existence. Therefore, in evolutionary procedure, the ensouling of things or their embodying is always the result of nature's abhorring a vacuum. Whenever a situation arises in nature, that situation must forever be ensouled. Any pattern that arises becomes the instrument for an entity. Any change in pattern destroys that particular availability and that entity ceases to manifest. But nature is producing eternally combinations or patterns. And the moment they form an orderly archetype, they are ensouled by a principle. Therefore, every pattern in nature is ensouled by something which is a plus to the pattern itself or additional to the sum of its own parts. And the thing that is greater than the sum of its own parts is the new entity or being composed of that sum. In the evolutionary procedure, the ancients firmly believed, therefore, that the time came when the motion of growth in nature produced a kind of organization in which a certain type of being was drawn from space and was able to associate itself or was invoked into union with this form and that when this occurred in man we have the living soul. Now that Pythagoras should have hit upon this formula is interesting inasmuch as Buddha has told us that what we call the being is actually also the product of six factors which are called attributes and that the union of these six constitute the instrument for the manifestation of man. All of these points then, uh, anthropologically speaking, simply indicate a time or a period infinitely remote in which man emerged as the compound of being and body. And that from that moment on, the whole progress of man has been the continuous flowing outward of being into and through body, and being moving through body into nature is the cause of culture. That culture is the manifestation of the being, not merely uh, the works of the body. That culture does not arise, totally at least, from the activity of environment or heredity upon the organism that true culture is the motion from within the organism of being through body. You might say under those conditions then, why is culture different? 
Why is culture gradated? Why have some peoples achieved it and others have not? And why are various cultures so essentially dissimilar in many respects? The answer to this is rather simple, however, when we think about it. Here, anthropology comes in with the correct solution. Anthropology shows us that the body, with its various instruments, is in a constant process of modification. And that these modifications of the body are the result of both heredity and environment. Therefore, heredity and environment, by their effect upon the body, determine its availability as an instrument of being. Thus, body, which is not so highly evolved in terms of organic qualification, is not as readily available, nor can being moving through this body achieve the cultural maturity immediately that it can if it is moving through a better body. Being, for example, we have no reason to suppose is any different in a two-year-old child than it is in a 40-year-old adult. The difference between infancy and adulthood is not in being but in body. And anthropology is the story of the racial development of man from infancy to adulthood. Consequently, it reveals to us uh, not the essential nature of the being, but the availability of the maturity of the body in its varying degrees. The small child is comparatively help helpless. Not because it is deficient in being, but because it is deficient in body. At various periods in its growth, through childhood, adolescence, and early maturity, the burden of its biological, anthropological, and ethnological development is so great that it is not available at any time for the complete release of the being within it. What we call majority or maturity is actually the body attaining a degree of mat maturity or completeness by means of which a moderate or normal degree of manifestation is possible to the being in the body. Here, therefore, we do not actually conflict between what might be perhaps called an idealistic approach and a materialistic approach. The difference lies in the source of the motivating factor. The anthropologist sees something happen. In various departments of living we also see things happen, but we do not always see the causes of these things. And the position here is that anthropology is the story of the gradual growing up of a kind of creature. And anthropology, therefore, is perfectly correct when it wishes to outlaw forever the idea that certain peoples are better than others, or that certain races are better than others and to reduce all these elements to the simple fact that all things which are consistent with themselves may be regarded as good. That which keeps its rules is honorable, and honor has nothing to do with the color of skin or the ethnological development of the people. It is an attainment on a cultural level by means of which things are measured in terms of themselves instead of terms of something else. I, on this basis, your philosophical or so-called esoteric viewpoint would also carry the same essential burden. The average parent does not regard his child as inferior because he recognizes within that child growing processes which he himself as an adult has passed through. And he is perfectly certain that in due course of time this child will mature and will become an adult and therefore will come into his natural heritage. The modern anthropologist is beginning to think the same way. 
that the different racial levels are the degrees and the unfolding of a body which is moving toward its natural maturity and that the only superiority or inferiority must be measured in the terms of what is the essential difference between a six-year-old and an eight-year-old child. There is only the difference of time, the difference of a little more uh, opportunity for the maturing of the body for the being within it. But anthropology is in no way convinced that the essential nature of being as psychic entity is determined by the appearance of body or by its cultural attainments alone. Therefore, that what we are really dealing with is an eternal motion of growth and that it is impossible for us to accurately determine the comparative merits or demerits of the various stages of this growth that all we must bear in mind is that the end of this growth is the victory of being over body or the attainment of ethnological and anthropological maturity and that what we look forward to as a golden age or a better time is little more than this that it is simply man finally gaining the maximum degree of manifestation by means of which being is released freely and adequately through body. We have the same thing on a cultural level where we have arts and sciences. A child born with the potential of a musician may never become one unless he is given advantages in music. He may remain, uh, remain forever a musician in his soul but his ability to express this music means that he must train the body as an instrument of purpose. And it is only when he has trained his hands properly to respond to the instincts and impulses of his mind and emotions that he can play the piano. Thus the body must be brought within the discipline of the being and must become the instrument for the expression of that being or the being itself remains forever inhibited. And anthropology, the descent of man, the cultural life of man, is the gradual revelation of this. The constant evidence that man and nature are conspiring to produce the kind of body by which the being may manifest its own integrity. This again brings up a psychological factor in connection with this. Namely, the possibility that this being itself is subject to certain infirmities, certain sickness, certain attitudes, by means of which, for example, collectively speaking, a race can destroy itself, or a culture can destroy itself. Here we come to a very complicated situation, and that is the relative interdependence of being and body. Being in, uh, the being instrument, as we know it, the psychic nature has been seriously misunderstood or certainly uh, abused in the terms of our modern thinking. We have come to the conclusion that being and mind represent synonymous terms. That being is superior to body because it is intellect. Nearly every one of the great thinkers of the ages have pointed out the fallacy of this position. They have warned us about it on the religious level and on the philosophical level. They have pointed out clearly that the intellect is not the being. Therefore, that the gradual substitution of, in, of intellect for being is a form of dying. That just as surely as being is forced out of manifestation by the crystallization of body, so being as culture, as the psychic entity of culture, is forced out of incarnation by the crystallization of a mental concept as a substitute for culture. In other words, when a culture crystallizes, it is the same as a body that gradually falls victim to rheumatism, arthritis, and other ailments. 
gradually the power of the being to function through the body is destroyed. If, therefore, intellect and emotion, through misunderstanding, are given a dominance or a preference, and gradually force the being into an unfavorable relationship with body, we may destroy a culture. We destroy it because we destroy its soul. This does not mean that we actually destroy the soul per se or in its own nature. Rather, we destroy the bridges by means of which the soul functions through the body. We lock the being. And the moment we lock the being, we are in a difficult situation. Being, as it is superior to body, cannot be held by body. And when a body is no longer suitable, and there is obviously no remedy possible, and a process of crystallization or disintegration has gone too far, being simply settles its relationship with body. <clears throat> And when soul severs its relationship with a culture, that culture dies. When the soul severs its relationship with a concept, that concept becomes extinct. Whenever the being finds itself in a condition utterly unfavorable, it departs from that condition and proceeds to move into other conditions more suitable. Now this tremendous stream of life moving along presents us with a number of opportunities or a number of specializations. Being has a choice of old cultures, rich in experience but infirm with age, of contemporary dominant cultures, mostly utterly confused, and of aboriginal cultures as yet comparatively undeveloped and for the most part unspoiled. Therefore, you will observe that wherever we get to a point of decadence in a, on an anthropological level, we almost immediately release a backward people. A so-called primitive people begins to move forward. The power of the world moves in the case of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire became culturally delinquent, became culturally corrupt, became like a body so ridden with disease that it could no longer function, or a psychic organization so ridden with complexes, fixations and neuroses that it could no longer serve as an instrument. Immediately we find culture moving out. Those that still possessed it in the Roman Empire went into the Near East and Arabia and created a new renaissance of culture there. That part which did not have sufficient strength to survive, that which had not recognized the difference between true and false culture, then passed under the influence of the Goths, the Huns, and the Ostrogoths. They were conquered by barbarians. And out of the barbarians came a new order of culture. And uh, just as the Romans got arrogant, so the barbarians in due term became cultural and arrogant. And step by step the process is repeated. But always where a people or a culture group which has been dominant loses dominance and it must always lose dominance by betraying its own psyche. It must always block the motion of being within itself. When this happens, being seems to depart and the weight of culture passes to another people. This people suddenly becomes alive after perhaps resting as the Huns and the Goths had rested for a thousand years without any more than tribal motion something happened. And within 500 years, these people moved into a dominant place in civilization, gradually filling the most important place of their time, the place left a vacuum by the collapse of the Roman Empire. Always, therefore, culture, instead of dying, moves toward primitive integration. 
The answer being, of course, that it is easier to work through a young body and build it forward than it is to work with an old and opinionated nature that already has built tremendous obstacles to progress. This is the reason why, in the anthropological culture, the great motivations, the great vital pressures of culture, are usually in the hands of the young. That is why the motion of generations arises from several sources. Youth inherits the cultural tradition. That part of the cultural tradition which is solid becomes useful to it. That which is decadent, youth resents and rises against. Youth makes its tremendous contribution and then having exhausted its initiative, it sinks back and waits for another generation of youth to carry on. But the motion is carried by youth. The consequences are contemplated by age. Each generation has its own youth. Every person who reaches age has had his hour of youth, has made certain motions. But in culture, a people unspoiled, as yet without the locking of sophisticated opinion, in each case rises up to meet the place left by decadence. That is perhaps culturally the reason why today many of the great arts of our people are coming uh, to recognize the importance of the so-called folk arts of primitive people simply because modern man culturally is sinking into an ocean of dishonesty and he is seeking in every way that he can to discover the one thing he knows he must have in culture, and that is honesty. Primitive man is honest and unschooled. Decadent man is schooled and dishonest. The struggle, therefore, is to recapture value. And the recapturing of value, if it can be done, preserves youth and perpetuates people. Those who do not grow old or lock themselves in the crystallization of their generations are the ones in whom creativity has remained and who are able to be young in the sense of dynamic and continue their dynamic through continual adjustment, which is the key of youth, whereas inability to adjust is the proof of age. In this, then, we have the concept of the soul in several different frameworks. But we have it as a total cause for man's emergence. We have the, the belief, esoterically advanced, that at a certain time, arbitrarily set in some systems as during the period which divided the Lemurian species from the Lemurian race, perhaps a very long time ago, not less than 40 million years ago, that a division actually took place and that a part of the biological growth in nature became capable of sustaining a kind of psychic entity. The animal kingdom also reached a point where it could sustain a psychic entity every kingdom, including the mineral, has psychic entity. In the mineral, the proof of this is the crystallization and the forms, the geometrical patterns which it takes. These different degrees of integration of body meant a constant moving of being into body on many levels. But that most vital to us as human beings is the motion of the human being into its relationship with body. As long as psychology neglects uh, the identity of being and fails to recognize that the principal directive of man is being and not body, and that the principal source of man's growth is not environment or heredity, but being, 
but that environment and heredity become the boundaries or become sensors over growth. So that by these factors growth is advanced or retarded. Then we find that the purpose of science is truly to become the handmaiden of being. That the purpose of science is to clear the confusion in body, mind, and emotion in order that the clear stream of being may be more immediately available. The conflict of body and being results in premature age and the destruction of man long before his time. When the conflict and competition in the relationships of body and being, the competition arising primarily from body, when this is understood and overcome, a great variety of situations, both cultural and physical, at the present time burdening the life of man, will be removed. And the individual entering into a partnership between being and body will discover that in this way he makes possible the more rapid development of himself. Uh, his purpose always is that body shall become immediately responsive to being. Therefore, actually, that all purposes by which man lives and cultivates and develops shall become sensitive to and responsive to the total purpose of being itself. And that man will never be happy until he fulfills being and that the general and natural and inevitable purpose of being is to unfold into expression the innate creativity of itself, a creativity beyond our comprehension. Therefore, man comes of age biologically, sociologically, culturally, philosophically, and spiritually when he becomes creative. Creativity rests in being and is communicated to body. And man becomes creative when he moves from within himself, and he usually becomes destructive when his life is governed only by body motion. To understand this is to advance one step in our study. I see the clock has advanced also, so we will continue this next week.